Hey guys, it's Ryan, and in this video we're going to look at the action potential, look at how an action potential propagates along an axon, and look at what's going on with the ion channels as this is all happening. So here we have graphed uh, an action potential, and on the y-axis we have the millivolts, um, the voltage of an axon at a certain point in time. So this number is relative to the extracellular fluid. So negative 70 means that inside the cell there are a lot more negatively charged things, usually uh, protein anions that are stuck inside the membrane and can't exit. So it keeps the inside of the cell very negative. And so this is resting membrane potential. When a neuron isn't excited by anything, isn't inhibited by anything, it's just chilling out and has no function, this is where it sits, at around negative 70 millivolts. Now, if that neuron is stimulated by some sensation, touching a hot oven, a stove, or something stupid like that, you could stimulate mechanical gated channels, and they'll open up and allow some influx of positive ions. Now, if the inside of the membrane inside the membrane reaches negative 55 millivolts or a threshold, then we'll have a whole chain of events occur, and that's when the actual action potential takes place. So down here we have um, a mapping of sodium channels and potassium channels. Now these are the voltage gated channels and are really the main players in determining how an action potential works. But there are also leak channels that are always open and they're, they're sort of like aquaporins for ions. They're always open, they require no energy, and they move things across the membrane from a high concentration to a low concentration. And what's important to know is that there are always more leak channels open for potassium ions. So that, that explains why the resting membrane potential is a lot closer to the equilibrium potential for potassium than for sodium. Now, the membrane or inside the membrane will never reach either of these values because that would require all of their leak channels to be open and no other channels to be open. So these are sort of theoretical numbers. So that's why all of the realistic numbers sit inside these two bounds. So let's talk about these voltage gated channels. At resting membrane potential, as we said, the leak channels are the only things open and they're more potassium for sodium than sodium. But these voltage gated channels are both closed as uh, pictured here. But once we reach that negative 55 millivolts of threshold, then the sodium gated, the voltage gated sodium channels are triggered. And they open up, allowing an influx of sodium. And that's what brings this action potential to life. That's what um, increases the charge inside the membrane so drastically because there's a whole bunch of sodium ions that rush through into the cell and make it positive. While this is happening, the potassium, the potassium channels are still not impressed and they stay closed. Now anytime that this is happening, we can call this depolarization because it's the charge within the membrane is becoming more positive than the resting membrane potential. Now it actually overshoots uh, a neutral charge and it goes beyond, not to plus 60, but it goes probably about to plus positive 30 millivolts and it reaches a peak. So this would be the depolarization peak up here. Now after some time, these sodium gated channels will inactivate and this little ball on a chain blocks the channel. So this happens within a few milliseconds of being open. And as this happens, the, the charge inside the membrane starts to decrease. And that's because once the charge gets about to this level, the potassium channels open. And this allows for the beginning of an efflux of potassium. And 
once potassium starts leaving the cell, then we're losing positive charge. And so the inside of the cell is becoming more and more negative. Now, after some time, once the charge gets close to resting membrane potential, the sodium channels will go from an inactivated state to just a, the normal closed state. And then it can, be, um, it can be returned back to its open state later on. Now, the potassium channels should be closed now, but they take a lot longer to close than the sodium channels do. So they stay open, and that's when the, this after hyperpolarization event takes place. It's not until a lot later that they, they end up fully closing, and then the resting membrane potential can be reestablished, mostly due to the action of sodium potassium ATP aces or pumps that can reestablish the high potassium inside the cell and the, the high sodium outside the cell. Now important to note with this inactivation is that the moment that these sodium channels open and also including the, the moments when they're inactivated this is the absolute refractory period. And because when they're open or inactivated, it ensures that each action potential is its own unique all or nothing event. So either you reach threshold and you get an action potential, or you won't reach threshold and you'll get nothing. And this absolute refractory period ensures that you won't get another action potential on top of this one, or you won't get this action potential moving backwards. So that's the whole reason you have this, this inactivation thing going on. And then after this moment, it's called a relative refractory period. That's because some of these sodium channels may still be inactivated. The potassium channels are still open, so it's not the ideal state where everything's closed and, and ready to go. So it'll take a little bit more of an st initial stimulus to, to get another action potential. This would be the relative refractory period. Okay, so now if we looked at the big picture, a lot of professors like to sort of do this and, and say that this is how an action potential propagates along an axon. And that's completely false. That's not how it works at all. In fact, it's better to think about it in terms of just little action potentials going like this along the cell. It's like triggering a trail of gunpowder and each bit sets off the next bit and so when you have a depolarization peak think about this is the thing that's moving across an axon and so when we're at when we're at the axon hillock that's where everything starts because there's the most sodium channels at this point but in this example here our depolarization peak is somewhere in this region. And that's because we know that usually inside the cell is negative, outside is positive. But here we have an inverted relationship. We have positive within the axon, which would say this is where the depolarization must be happening. And so this is where the depolarization peak is at a certain point. And once these regions become positive, they'll set off the next adjacent region, which will trigger the next adjacent region with sodium channels and so on. And then when you have a myelinated region, there's no area for charge to escape, so it'll simply jump to the next non-myelinated region and continue along this way. So I hope you found this video helpful, and I'll see you all next time.